Welcome to another episode of the Peak Potential Success Show. My name is Fong Chua. I'm an entrepreneur, business strategist, real estate investor, figure and also best-selling author. And every single day, I help others unlock potentials and guide them to succeed. Today on the show, we have a very, very special guest. Um, I was very fortunate to meet, to meet and connect with this person at a conference recently. And when I heard her speak, when I heard her message, I thought, wow, this is somebody I need to have on my show, share her message, because I think it's very, very important for people to be aware and also uh, hear about these things that's going on in our lives. We're in a world right now that everybody's busy. Uh, we're all drowned in the internet and the digital space that sometimes we forget certain things. We don't pay too much attention as to uh, what's going on. And she really puts an impact and an emphasis on these things that's going on that is very, very important. And she's done that. And she's impacted so many people's lives. And she's helped so many other people as well. Uh, she's in. She's an expert in online uh, child protection. She's written two books, The Digital Sexual Victims True. Uh, cases. Also, the internet are children in charge. Uh, she's written and directed and produced the the movie Vulnerable Innocence. She's spoken all around the world from conferences to schools to crime stoppers. She's been featured all in different media outlets, uh, CTV, Washington Post, Toronto Sun, just to name a few. So please, 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 please uh, welcome award-winning producer, director, international speaker, and the expert in the theory of digital supervision, Ms. Charlene Doak Gabar. Hello. Hey, how are you? I'm great, thanks. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for being here. Um, it's always great to connect with people who make so many, uh, who, who who makes a big difference in lots of people's lives and puts an emphasis on certain messages that doesn't get that much attention. Uh, so before we get into the deep and deep questions, share with us uh, who you are, what you do, and how did you get to where you are today? Well, that's a loaded question, but I'm <laughs> quite happy to answer it. I am um, founder and chair of the federal Canadian charity Internet Sense First. We provide funding for victims of internet child exploitation for therapy. And we're also, um, one of our objectives is to educate. And we educate about my theory of digital supervision. I'm a computer science specialist in education and a network administrator. And I discovered that there is a huge gap between the knowledge of what is going on online and actually what's happening. Uh, the reality, people do not know. And that is a huge problem. I'm also the founder and chair of the Anti-Internet Child Exploitation Team of Expert Speakers, the ASIC Council. There are people from Canada and the United States that speak in their specific area that expands on my theory of digital supervision. And I'm also, as you said, the producer uh, co-director and writer for the film Vulnerable Innocence, which is based on my theory of digital supervision. Mm -hmm. How did you get here? Well, I um, had a family member that was a victim of child pornography by neighbors. And people say by neighbors, and I say, yep, you have no idea how good these people are. And um, she lived her life, the life of a sexually exploited child and got into different things that she shouldn't have gotten into. And then later on, she was killed by a drunk driver at the age of 22. She was a victim at the age of four. And um, major crimes that my family had been affected by. And I wondered, how can I help my family? I've got computer science, what can I do? And I started investigating the crime and realized the proliferation of it and that it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And I could then understand why my family member felt so victimized because I've talked to some therapists that say, oh, it's just sexual exploitation. And I caution anyone in saying that, certainly the word just should never be in front of it. Right. But this isn't a, a, a crime that happened within four walls. It's People have to realize that these victims are wondering who's looking at their picture or video today around the world. And it is a different type of exploitation that is so encompassing that um, we have to start looking at supervising our children online. And that was why I came up with digital supervision. I launched my um, charity the day after the drunk driver was convicted, mm -hmm. killed her. And then 
I gradually wrote my first book and I decided, what am I going to call this? And I called it Theory of Digital Supervision. Wrote my second book, which is in more detail. And then the family said, why don't you do a documentary? And I went, sure, I will. Okay, what do I do now? <laughs> and, <clears throat> and I managed to uh, get the documentary out there, hoping people wouldn't make fun of it. And 24 awards later, we've done all right. It was a good team that they had put together for it. Wow, uh, that's um, that's amazing. And thank you for doing all that, because I'm sure having that type of presence, the books, the the movie, uh, it, your reach gets larger and larger, so, so that it brings more awareness to it. Now, in, in today's world, like I mentioned before, everybody's very busy. There's stuff going on all the time. Um, everybody kind of just goes, oh, it's the internet. That's what you need. But we tend to forget about the aspect of what you're talking about. Now, are there signs? Are there certain signals or certain things that people should pay attention to? So they go, okay, this is maybe the first, second, third step towards something that's going to become very bad. Alienation from parents is a huge part of it. Um, and that happens when a child's being exploited anyway. They, the predator works at alienating the family from the child. Um, ch mood swings, like kids not wanting to do family things. They're being completely resistant to par parental requests. Now that could be any teenager, but when it gets to a point that it's an extreme and they're on the computer constantly, parents have to start realizing that they have a problem. Hmm. And not to alarm everyone, but there are children that are six, seven, eight years old addicted to pornography. Oh, wow. Their parents don't know. And uh, these children are huddled on a computer. I've had parents from around the world call me and say, look, my child is on triple X porn. What do I do? And I say, first of all, it's a good thing you notice. A lot of people don't. Mm -hmm. Second of all, your child is no doubt addicted to porn. And it's time to start making some changes in your family. And um, I think one of the biggest mistakes parents can make is um, uh, blaming their child for being on porn. When there is so much free porn out there, and if it's a shared computer and children are using it and porn pops up because a family member is on porn, the only person to blame is the adult in the house because that shouldn't be happening. Um, these signs are there. Um, for example, I'll give you an example. People can understand through example better. I was talking to a 10 year old one day and I, of course I have this on my mind a lot when I'm around children. And I said, tell me, what games do you like to play? Oh, my favorite game is Ark. And I went, oh, okay. He explained to me a little bit about it. And I said, are there any grown-ups on that game? He said, oh, yeah, all different kinds of grown-ups. And I said, do you have any friends that play that game? Now, these are questions people just ask in conversation. Oh, yeah, there's one really nice guy. And, of course, my smoke starts coming out of my ears. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm sure it's a nice guy. Tell me, does he have another, does he have a son your age, 10 years old? And he said, yeah, how would you know? They like to get things in common with a child immediately. And it's a part of the grooming process. Mm -hmm. Grooming, meaning that you're grooming them to trust you. I said, oh, yeah. So do you ever talk to his son? He said, no. One time I was playing, though, and he said his son was taking over. The 10-year-old was taking over, and and he'd be playing with him. And I said, okay. Well, I noticed you wanted some new headphones. Did he suggest the headphones? And he said, well, yes, yes, he did. And this kid thought, like, I was a genius because I knew all this stuff. The predator wants him to get certain headphones so that no one can hear them talk. Mm. And then the predator will start speaking in code to the child. So he'll say, look, let's just say you're coming over for a science exam. What's a friend of yours? Okay, we'll say you're coming over to study science. And the child will then say at his end, yeah, I'll come over. But they're actually making it a point to um, play maybe at two o'clock in the morning because the parents aren't supervising. Mm. Things like that. And if parents aren't watching what their children are doing online, they're asking for trouble. Wow. Every school I speak in, the principal will say, you know, we, we have a real problem here. There are kids sharing nudes all the time. And nudes are them obviously naked, but they call them nudes. 
And uh, there are kids that I've interviewed that are 16, 17 years old, and they'll say, you should see the galleries of nudes on their cell phones. Parents don't look. They don't care. Wow. Like, if we're not looking at what our children are doing, have you noticed all of the shootings and everything else going on in the world? Mm -hmm. Everyone is like, what is going on? And I suggest to everyone that we are experiencing the first generation that grew up on the internet. Right. They're playing first person video games, shooter video games that are um, teaching them that uh, shooting is fun, mm -hmm. killing is fun. And you see them going into schools, shooting and, and killing, and then they might kill themselves, which is, you know, is unfortunate because maybe someone could interview them and find out why they're like that. It doesn't take rocket science to figure out when you're on a first person shooter video game, you're, you're being rewarded points for killing people and it's made to be fun. The manufacturers make sure it's fun. Mm -hmm. And then they, you get guns in a house or the kid gets a hold of a gun. Then it becomes fun to go out and kill people They've lost their sense of humanity, their sense of compassion and love for other human beings. They're just objects in a video game. So obviously this is something that uh, it, th there's not enough light on, on this, this topic. Um, how, would, how would one go about to make sure that their fi family environment is, is protected from all this? Um, what are some of the steps? What are some of the things that they could do with their, on um, their digital space? Um, who do they connect to? How do they get involved to make sure that this is as avoidable as possible? Well, uh, first of all, parents have to start talking to other parents to find out what's going on in their houses. This isn't hanging the dirty laundry. Everyone's going through this in the world. And the other thing, I, I part of digital supervision, I tell parents. Put your router in, either in the family, into the master bedroom, or a locked closet and the parents have the key, so that you can turn it off at night. There are two reasons for this. Number one, you want to make sure your child cannot get online at night. And number two, you're telling your child you are in charge of the internet. Because right now, most kids think they are. Mm -hmm. they, they're just getting off with murder online. And people, literally, the video games, but people will say, um, my child knows so much more than I do about it. And I'm like, your child is not a genius because they can operate these machines. They're so user-friendly. Mm -hmm. I've taught advanced level computer programming and I've taught um, computer applications. Their, their aptitude on these games is about equal. It does not take genius material to run them. Your child may be running their fingers on a cell phone. You think that's genius. No, it means they can move their thumbs fast. You know, look at their cell phones. Check the icons on the cell phone. See that it's not connecting to uh, a nude's ring around the school because this is happening. That The one thing is to move that router and have the children dock their cell phones in the parental bedroom at night for charging mm -hmm. so that they do not have access to any digital means. Make sure there are no unsecured routers in your neighborhood. That's the first step to taking over the internet in your house. Mm -hmm. Because if listeners realize it, they have to realize that if they haven't done all this, their child is in charge of their internet. Right. So we'll say, well, we have rules. They can only be online at certain times. Well, big deal. <laughs> are you watching what they're doing? Mm -hmm. That is a good step. And I commend people for doing it. Mm -hmm. But there's so much more that needs to be done. We have to digitize our parenting. Yeah. Is there is there a a, a system or is there a a rule of thumb or something? Because like sometimes when you go, okay, we have to watch this. We have to make sure we know everything that they're doing. And then there there comes that that barrier of what's trusting and what's not trusting. Is it overstepping and not enough? How do you navigate through that? Well, my first question to anyone is: Do you drive your child to school? Mm -hmm. You drive them to their sporting games, their dance routines. You drive them everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, yet they they can go online with no supervision. Because it's protectionism that's taking you to drive your child to school, 
to make sure they're with other friends when they walk to school, things like that. If we don't start looking directly on what they're doing on these devices, we're selling our this generation short right. and that generation's already graduating and we're seeing the, the results of it. Mm -hmm. The shooting, the lack, the lack of compassion, the, the gang people being beaten up by gangs and they're taping it and putting it online with pride and laughter. There's something wrong with that. We're not doing our jobs. Traditional parenting is excellent. People have to change their mindset that they have to digitize, put a key logger on a cell phone of a child. Mm -hmm. Then you will know the key, every keystroke they make comprehensive will take, give you the pictures and videos that they're sharing and things like that. And then every time I speak, someone will say, isn't this an invasion of privacy? And I, I caution anyone on that one because this is not a diary in the end table of a bedroom. Mm -hmm. This is the internet. Right. So I say, is it invasion of privacy or evasion of parental responsibility? Give you a bit of a history lesson. In the year 2000, I was managing a network and I was, uh, we were in awe of a brand new network that had moving pictures, animated GIFs. 22 years later, we are live streaming. We have Zoom. Yep. We have all these things. 22 years isn't a long time for parents to realize the need to digitize their parenting. We have to start making sure our children know that we are in charge of what's going on. If a parent has a cell phone for a child, they have given it to them for Christmas. I will ask the parent, the kids in the school, how many of you own a cell phone? Every hand will go up and I'll say, no, you don't. Your parents do. And whatever is done on that cell phone, they are responsible for it for two reasons. They pay for the plan. They own the plan. But you're under the age of 18. And if you are um, exchanging inappropriate pictures, then your parents have the pic pictures in their hand. It's their responsibility. Mm -hmm. Getting your parents in. When I'm done talking like this and I tell these kids this, they're like, really? And they all think they're going to get off with it. A lot of them are. But there's going to be that one child that's going to get caught. And they will be charged for producing and distributing. Wow. So so many things that's going on in the background that not not a lot of people know about and uh they they're very important. And it's it's actually incredible that it's so commonplace that people don't don't ask these questions. So uh the thing is you you talk to so many different people. <laughs> you talk to to kids, you talk to adults, you talk to people worldwide, different cultures, uh, different traditions. Uh, how, is that something that you need to kind of change the way you speak? Uh, how do you build that connection with all these different types of people, all these different age groups, so that you're able to really connect and not have them hate you or not have them be uh, offended when you, you deal with these difficult subjects? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I have been faced with different religions and cultures. It's a common ground. And I've spoken in Iceland, India, Europe, the United States, Canada. It's the common denominator. Everyone is having this problem. The only uh, the only time, like some people don't want me to use the words child pornography, but it is in the criminal code of just about every country out there. It's the definition. What is the definition of a child, anyone under the age of 18? Not age of consent, age definition of a child. The UN defines a child as anyone under the age of 18. Um, and child pornography, maybe child sexual abuse material. I find with any audience, I get people understanding it better when I use the terminology child pornography. So I interchange them. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it's the same message anywhere. And I don't get people offended. I get people all of a sudden very compassionate and a little more alert, mm -hmm. a whole lot more alert, should, should I say, because I don't pull any punches. I say, this is what's going on. And our child are being victimized, not so much by unknowns. 
It's the peers that are doing it. Asking for nudes. Mm -hmm. Ask for nudes instead of a date. And then they'll say, if I get a nude, maybe I'll go out with you. Mm. Well, so when you're speaking to kids or children, um, how do you how do you make it so that they respect what you're asking or respect what you're saying? Everything is interactive. Mm -hmm. And now that I have my documentary, I've taken little clips out of the documentary. There's one scene with children talking to a predator and I'll play that. And then I'll ask them, now what, what should this, these children not have shared? And they all come up with different ideas. You know, they know. And um, then I'll say, okay, this is what the predator at, at the other end is like after he has interviewed these children. And this is the predator that says, wow, talk about reeling them in. Holy cow, did I ever get a bunch of pictures? They didn't even know mm -hmm. that I was doing it through their webcam. And after that, the kids are like, and I'll tell them, like, you do not know the age of the person. You do not know truly what they might look like because of deep fakes. Or they've just put a picture up on the webcam so that the kids can't see him. So that because he's 45 years old as opposed to 10, mm -hmm. he may have a voice filter that makes him sound like a 10 year old. These are all things that predators are using. And people say, well, the schools have to educate these children. This is what a lot of parents are saying, which is good. Mm -hmm. But the schools, when I go in, the kids listen. They're not going to listen to their teacher. They're not going to listen to their parents. They're certainly scared of the police. So when they're there, they're like, but when I go in, it's a little more realistic. Mm -hmm. And um, the kids then have an idea of, what's really going on. I'm very gentle with kids. I do not use the terms child pornography. I talk about inappropriate pictures and they know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I see. Now, uh, you talked about your film and your, your kind of process as to how you got to creating that film. But you also mentioned that you go, well, now what do I do? Uh, yeah. How do I get started? So how was that pro process? Like, did you just go, you know what, I I'm going to go find find somebody else to ask questions to? Or how did you get that started? And then also becoming that uh, award winning director and producer of that of that film? I did a lot of uh, studying. And um, I had a production team that gave me advice. You know, they had ideas. And um I wrote the, the script and all of it. And I had about 30 people that I have met worldwide. All I had to do was ask. And they said, I'm in. We want to protect our children. And it was trial and error. I filmed most of it virtually, mm -hmm. either virtually or on a cell phone. Oh, wow. And people may find that incredible, but that's the way I did it because of COVID. I didn't want to expose anyone to COVID. Mm -hmm. And, um, and here we are. I, I, um, interviewed people in the UK, Australia, West Indies, things like that. And it gives authenticity to the film is what I've been told. Mm -hmm. Because um, there are no bells and whistles in the film, no special effects. It's very straightforward with information people need to hear. Nothing to detract from the truth in mm -hmm. the film. You, you also mentioned that uh, you were putting this out there. And one one kind of thought process that came into your mind was hopefully nobody laughs at it so at that there's a there's a gap where okay i'm gonna put it out there for people to to judge and criticize but then there's also that that internal kind of desire to go you know what i need to do this i need to share it how did you overcome that hump of potentially having people laugh at you make fun of it or whatever i think i think i was just determined mm -hmm. What happened to my family <clears throat> is what, <clears throat> excuse me, is what got me started in it all. And I know how much my family member suffered, as well as her parents, our whole family. And once I've done so much research and um, trying to help people, I just, I just had faith in what I was doing mm -hmm. and hoped for the best. And I had a lot of, I, I hired an editor that, um, and he was the only paid person that really um, made it so that it was, that it was better. I did the initial edit 
which was a lot because there were hours and hours of tape. And I learned video editing <laughs> through all of this. But when you've taught computer science, you've learned software like the night before you had to teach. So, you know, it, it wasn't a really big deal for me. Mm -hmm. But um, <clears throat> and then I entered a film festival, got accepted. And I don't think if, unless someone's been in film, you don't realize that to be accepted to the film, a film festival is a win in itself. So I started getting all these acceptances and I thought, wow, this is pretty good. And then we started getting best educational documentary at a Liverpool, England and Las Vegas. Wow. Best international documentary out of Austin, Texas, like just goes on and on. There's more information on the website vulnerableinnocence.co that um, lists the awards. And there's a trailer for the for the film. I'm very pleased that um, Las Vegas gave us the ed best educational, but we just did a red carpet screening last week in Las Vegas. Oh, wow. With international people, like people came from different countries to the event. And uh, I mean, proud to say I was on Fox News in Las Vegas. Like, I mean, who would have thought that two years ago when I started this? Mm. Wow. It's needed. And we were also accepted to Film Hub, one of the biggest distributors in the world. And at this point, we're being streamed on six different channels. Oh, wow. Which is, I, I often tell everybody, have no expectations. And I've never had them. Mm -hmm. And I'm pleasantly surprised. If you have expectations, quite frankly, you can become obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because people, they're just like this, you know, gimme 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 and for me it is i've had no expectations and i wait to see how things unfold mm -hmm. and that's my advice to anybody wow. believe what you're doing but have no expectations because you shoot yourself in your foot when you do mm -hmm. no uh throughout your this, this interview uh you you've come across as somebody who's spent a lot of time uh doing self-learning doing lots of research uh you have a very very uh, critical mind that allows you to piece things together. I mean, computer science, like that's not, that's not an easy topic to, to get into. Plus yeah. then from there to, to the speaking, to international accolades, to the, like films and all that kind of stuff. Um, is there something that uh, somebody else has told you or advised you or guided you that made your life a lot easier? There was one really good friend of mine. I started this and she was my supply teacher um, at the time because I, I started all this. I was in a bad car accident and had to quit teaching. And then I got into all this stuff based on my niece and everything else. She said, Charlene, you need to write a book. And I said, well, Heather, I've never written a book. Like she says, oh, shut up. You, you type nine words a minute. Just sit down and start writing because she had written books. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I wrote my first book. It was nominated for an international award by a teaching organization in the United States. And I'm proud to say I was nominated. I didn't get the award, but I managed to get it on my first book. Yeah. That probably was one of the best things anyone told me because it, it did protect my intellectual property. And, uh, and then I wrote my second book. And then I've got my theory of digital supervision is copywritten through intellectual properties of Canada, mm -hmm. which goes through different countries. So no one can use those term terms or say they own it because I have two levels of copyright. And that's one thing I'd caution anyone about. Think nothing of writing a book to protect what you're doing. It's so important because there are thieves out there everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that was the best advice I ever had. Wow. Uh, so in the, in the next few years now or in the near future, what's the next big thing for you? I don't know. I, I, as I say, it just, my family suggested doing the film mm -hmm. and I, no, well, maybe I'll try that. And I have to admit, I felt like a mosquito in a nudist colony. I didn't know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went, okay, I'm going to read up about it. I read up about doing film and documentaries. I studied, um, I have three video editing softwares. I studied them all. Well, and then I decided, well, maybe, maybe I can uh, 
do a film. I asked around who wants to be involved and it just happened. Mm -hmm. So at this point, someone asked me if I would produce a film for them. And I'm like, whoa, I don't know about that. (laughs) You know, I, um, uh, people that have never done film or been involved had no idea the amount of work. Mm -hmm. There's nothing easy about it. Right. And I mean, it looks easy. I've got all these awards, you know, I've got um, best producer, best director and all of that. But um, wow, you know, it didn't come without a lot of effort. Have you found that uh, reaching those, those, uh, well, achieving those accolades and then also with the books, the film, has that in turn brought more attention to your message and brought more attention to who you are, what you do? and kind of expanded it even more. Uh, Do you find that doing more of that stuff would even help you expand even wider? It would. Yeah. I mean, if I hadn't done the film, I wouldn't have been screened at a red carpet event in Las Vegas. If we hadn't won 24 awards, that red carpet event wouldn't have happened. So it's a matter of um, making sure you cover detail. I'm certainly hoping that I get more, um, speaking engagements out of it because the more people I speak in front of, the more children will be protected. Mm -hmm. And the film is um, going to help the sustainability of my charity so that we might be able to help more children Mm -hmm. worldwide. Actually, yeah, speak more about that charity uh, and and then how people could be more involved with that. Well, uh, we're all online. we have an office where we get email and things like that. People will ask me, how can I help you? And I'll tell them I need social media support because I can only do so much. And a lot of people don't have that. So that's basically where we need the help is getting the word out. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just communication of all of it because we've been declared the best educational, um, um charity in the world by an organization in the UK which a lot of people in Canada don't even know we exist right so it's getting the word out it's getting there mm-hmm. at the event in um Las Vegas it was the Shiro Foundation in Las Vegas that hosted it and they're an anti-human trafficking organization and a lot of anti-human trafficking organizations see the merit in what I'm doing especially the film That's why they hosted it. And we had an award given to a lady that has worked for both organizations, Holly Dowling, for her work in anti-human trafficking and online child protection. And I have often always said solidarity without borders for the protection of all of our children globally. And that award, as I spoke in Las Vegas, was very significant. Mm -hmm. We have to do this without borders. So the Shiro Foundation and Internet Sense First and Vulnerable Innocence worked together for the safety of our children. And that was quite an effort. Mm -hmm. Not not an effort emotionally, just a good effort towards the online protection of children. Well, well, thank you very much for all that stuff, because I know it's very important for people to be aware of it. Um, Hopefully everybody could jump on to your 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 website and uh, help out and contribute and bring more awareness, spread the word around. Now, if I was to put you on the world stage and everybody, entire world is listening to Charlene and you have one message that you want everybody to remember Charlene for, what would that one message be? The biggest message is that we are in the digital age and we have to digitize our parenting, caregiver and professional skills for the sake of our children and society in general. Very powerful words. Uh, Thank you for that. Now, I know your time is very uh, valuable. And uh, before I let you go, um, I'm going to ask you five quick rapid fire questions um, for fun. And give me the first thing that comes to mind. So let's say you are stranded on a deserted island and you get one food to eat for the rest of your life. No consequence. What food would that be? Peanut butter. Oh, wow. (laughs) Um, If you had an opportunity to win the gold medal in any sport, in any event, what would that be? Kayaking. Cool. Have you kayaked? Oh, I love it. Something you do on a pass. Oh, nice. 
oh, yeah. um, you're on a car ride, road trip, and for whatever reasons, there's one song that's stuck on repeat over and over again. What's that one song you don't mind listening to for hours and hours on end? Oh, there's so many songs. I don't have a rapid answer to that one, but um, probably, um, oh, it was an ACDC. No, not ACDC. Uh, the Time of Your Life. Nice. That's the one. Um, Hollywood calls, you know, you know what? You have this amazing story. We want to do a movie on you. Uh, let's meet up. Let's, uh, let's, let's get to know each other. But they want to have dinner with you first. And you go, no problem. Why don't you all come over to my house? I'll serve you dinner. What's that special dish that you would prepare, prepare for them? Well, I would ask my husband because he's a chef. He would make the dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and then my last, uh, before I get to my last question, give me a number between one to five. Three. One, two, three. So if you would have to relate success to a turtleneck, how are those two things similar? I used to be addicted to turtlenecks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, success to a turtleneck. I think, quite honestly, that you bring that up, a lot of children that have been sexually abused will dress right up to here because they want to cover their bodies. There are two forms. They're either fully covered or they are completely um, uh, scantily clad because they believe that is how they can get people to like them. Mm -hmm. But that turtleneck, that's actually a good, a good uh, comparison because that's truthfully what can happen with children. I see. Well, thank you for that. Um, once again, thank you very much for your time. Um, your, your words, your message is very, very impactful. I'm hoping lots of people will get in touch with you. And if so, what's the best way to do so? Vulnerable dot innocence at bell.net or 519-854-1249. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, any last words from you? Anything else you want to share? I'd like to share that this has been an excellent interview. You've asked some amazing questions okay. and it's zeroed, it got me zeroed in on areas that I like to share. So I thank you very much for that. Well, thank you very much for being here. And it's always a, a joy connecting with people as uh as impactful and somebody who likes to add value as much as yourself. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And for everybody else, make sure you get uh, you get in touch with Charlene, check out her, her movie, um, her books, and also uh, if you can con contribute or be involved with her charity, that would be uh, very great as well. Spread the word, something that's very, very important, something that lots of people may or may not notice is happening in their daily lives. So just spread the word, get people to notice that this is going on in the world. It's very, very important. Uh, so again, her name is Charlene. My name is Fong Chua. Until next time, today is the day to unlock your peak potential. Well, I'll see you later.